Kia ora tato. wonderful to be here and thanks, uh, thanks all for coming out. So my brief is to take us through in something like five minutes, who knows, it could be six or seven, uh, the basic ideas around the science of climate change and some of the implications for New Zealand. So just to start off, the, uh, the, the most fundamental part of the science of climate change, what's happening today? So uh, the first point, all of the energy in the climate system, the weather, the climate, the changes from year to year come from the sun, the seasons, you name it. So all of the energy in the earth system comes from the sun ultimately. And the main point here is that the, the air, the atmosphere is pretty much completely transparent to sunlight. So the air is not warmed directly by the sun. The, the sunlight that isn't reflected away gets to the earth's surface and gets absorbed by the earth. So the earth warms up. And so, just like the sun does, the Earth radiates energy back out into space. Now, it turns out the atmosphere is not transparent to the energy the Earth radiates, heat energy, infrared energy, the same energy a, a bar heater puts out, or our bodies for that matter. There are gases in the air, which we call greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, water vapour, methane and so on, that are really, really good at absorbing that heat. So the atmosphere warms up as well, and it radiates heat in all directions, and half of that ends up getting radiated back down to the surface of the Earth. So the Earth is warmed directly by the sun, and it's also warmed by the, the heat in the atmosphere. So the, these are the two things going on in the climate system, basically. If you want to change the surface temperature of the Earth, you want to change the climate, you've got uh, two choices. You can either change the amount of sunlight that's falling on the Earth, or you can change the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. That, that's it. That explains the ice ages, it explains all of the climate history of the Earth that we know about, and it explains what's happening today. So right now, sunlight is not changing, and the brightness of the sun, apart from a very tiny change, has hardly changed for a very long time, at least a, a century or so. But the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere uh, has increased a great deal in the last couple of hundred years. And we know from the chemistry of these gases that that increases come from the burning of fossil fuels, carbon that's been stored underground for a very long time. Now, this, this greenhouse gas stuff that's covering the earth, it's very like a duvet on a bed or a blanket. If you're in bed and you put a blanket over the top, underneath that blanket you're going to stay a bit warmer than you would be if you had no blanket, especially in the winter. Uh, if you put a thicker blanket on, then you're going to be warmer again. The, the amount of the greenhouse gas over the earth, it's like a blanket around the earth, and if you put more of that stuff in the air, it's like putting a thicker blanket on the earth, and the surface underneath is going to get warmer. That's the basic idea. So we know just by increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, you're bound to get some warming. All right, so how has this stuff changed over time? Um, here's how the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has changed in the last 13,000 years or so. Uh, the reason we talk about this stuff, carbon dioxide, is because it stays in the air so long. Um, most of the carbon dioxide that was emitted when the first steam engines got going in the 1700s is still in the air. We're still breathing a bit of it right now. So it takes centuries or up to thousands of years for this stuff to get out of the atmosphere through natural processes once you put it in. So that's part of the reason why I've got such a big long time scale here, going back to um, 13,000 years ago and up to the present. And the amount of carbon dioxide is the vertical scale in parts per million. So it's, it's a very small fraction of the atmosphere. 400 parts per million is only 0.04%, but it's a re really, really important uh, small fraction of the atmosphere. So you can see that um, for several thousand years, we're sitting at around 280 or a little bit less parts per million. And in the last little while, um, it's gone up to over 400 parts per million. We're about 407 or 408 parts per million at the moment. And in terms of the way the ice sheets think and the way the ocean circulation thinks, it's happened like this. It's been an almost instantaneous spike because, again, it takes a thousand years or more for these <coughs> pardon me, slower parts of the Earth system to respond to this. And it's been a very long time since we had this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
In fact, it's been something like three or maybe even four million years since the, the air that we're breathing today was like it is now. So it's before humans even evolved that uh, we last had an atmosphere like this. So OK, we've got this slicker duvet on our um, global bed, <coughs> and the Earth is indeed getting warmer. This is global average temperature over the last 140 years or so. The zero line here is the temperature before 1900, the closest we can get to the pre-industrial value. And you can see plenty of ups and downs. There's volcanoes, there's El Ninos, you name it. But there's an obvious upward trend. In the last three years, have all been more than one degree above that pre-industrial value. The Paris Agreement uh, talks about keeping the warming well below two mm. degrees above pre-industrial. So we're well on the way to that, and we need to take some action pretty soon to, to stop the warming getting much further. But this, this warming here is, is only a tiny fraction of the story. It's the real tale of the dog. But the main event in terms of warming of the climate system is actually what's mm. happening in the oceans. Because the ocean covers nearly three quarters of the Earth's surface, and because water is really good at absorbing heat and absorbing energy, most of the heating has actually gone into ocean water rather than into the air. Uh, the, the little beige bar at the bottom is um, what's gone into the atmosphere there. It's only about 1% of the, the total heating. This is good news because it slows down the rate of warming. If all of the heating had gone into the atmosphere, temperatures would already have gone up over 50 degrees and we'd all be dead. We wouldn't be having this conversation. So this, this is great. But Tim will explain a bit later uh, some of the downsides of how much, why having a lot of extra heat in the ocean is, is not a great idea. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, and I think the big question everyone wants to ask and everyone wants to think about taking action on is, is where do we go in future? So again, um, we've got this graph has got time along the bottom from the middle of last century to the end of this century on the right, and temperature change up the vertical axis. So on the left of that vertical bar, the, the present, or 2005 actually, um, change in temperature in the second half of the 20th century, about a oh, bit over half a degree of warming. Uh, and then into the future, to the end of the century, we've got two, two scenarios, two possible futures. The blue line, with its, you know, there's uncertainty here because it's a forecast. Um, that's something like the Paris Agreement future. The, the zero line on the vertical, that's the temperature at the end of the 20th century. And if we follow the Paris Agreement, we hopefully will get no more than one more degree of warming. If we don't do anything and we just keep burning the oil and, and all the rest of it, as we have done the last few decades, then we could be on the red line, which would see something like four degrees or maybe even more warming this century on top of the degree or so we've had already. And that would put us into a climate that hasn't been uh, seen on the earth for many millions of years. And ultimately it would lead to melting of all the ice on the planet. It would be just a, an unimaginable climate to be living in. So we really don't want to get, we don't want to stay on that red line. We really need to get onto the blue line or if we can make it to something below that blue line. So we're talking about keeping the warming from here at uh, no more than about one more degree, which doesn't sound like a lot, I'll have to say. But uh, when you think about it, it, it has big implications. So now, I've, now my graph, again, this is global mean temperature change. It's that 140 odd years worth I showed you before, but it's all squeezed into the left-hand half of the graph. So we've got 1880 at the left-hand end, then we've got 2120 at the right hand end, so um, 100 years into the future. Let's imagine that we had one more degree of warming. We met up with the, the top end of the Paris Agreement. So if I came back here in, in 2118 and gave this talk again, then we might have a graph that looked like that. So this is, this is if we allow temperatures to go up and, and uh, here's the two degree mark. So some of, some of the years are just bumping up above two degrees within 100 years or so from now. Now, I'm not saying this is exactly how it's going to play out, but it's, you know, it's got the same sorts of ups and downs as we've seen in the past, plus another degree of warming. And at present, or um, as of 2016, that was the warmest year on record. It still is. 2016 is still the warmest year on record. And the point I want to make here is that um, 
you see that over the next 15 or 20 years, there are some years that are below that black line. But after that, after about 2040, every year is warmer than what we now call the warmest year on record. And that's just with a few tenths of a degree more global warming. So we would be into a completely unknown climate by the middle of the century, even with a little bit more warming. So that can have massive implications. There was a, a scientific paper written in Australia last year that got a lot of media attention, talking about the big cities in Australia, especially Sydney and Melbourne, having days where the temperature would get over 50 degrees C. Obvious implications for energy supply, public health, you name it. Uh, it would, only, it would be a pretty rare event, I think, even by the end of the century, but it would be a huge thing to have to deal with. And these cities already get temperatures over 40 degrees sometimes, so we're not saying that Nelson's going to have days over 50 degrees soon. But you would start to see high temperatures that will be outside anything that we've observed before. So just uh, zooming in a little bit on New Zealand, um, if we have a two, a two degree warming, would go with something like a tripling of the number of hot days. So it depends, you know, you can choose your limit, 25 degrees, 30 degrees, whatever, and you see roughly uh, three times as many hot days in a two degree warming scenario compared to, you know, the past climate. Take away a bit of rain, and this is happening in the places that are already on the dry side, such as Marlborough and Canterbury, and you see something like uh, three times as many droughts, and droughts becoming longer and, and drier. Uh, put those things together and you see a large part of the country, especially in the east from south of Dunedin all the way through to East Cape, would be in either very high or extreme fire danger for virtually half the year. And, and fires like the one that occurred on the Port Hills in the summer of last year would start to happen a lot more often, or potentially could be happening a lot more often. Uh, the big glaciers in the Southern Alps, um, my um, glacier modelling colleagues at Victoria University tell me that with this kind of warming, the ice would recede right up the valleys. It's, it's receding at the moment on the Fox and the Franz, and there really wouldn't be much to look at for the tourist uh, trade, or, or for us for that matter. You'd have to get right up onto the main divide to see any ice. And this kind of thing would happen quite a lot more. So as the sea level rises, it becomes easier and easier for the waves to come inland and to start eating away at whatever's in its way. But this is a road in South Canterbury a couple of years ago, uh, and I, I show this because the road itself was a few metres, like five or six metres above sea level. But it doesn't matter if you're more than a metre or two metres above sea level. If, if your road or your house is close enough to the high tide mark, as the sea level rises, the, the waves are going to come inland and they're just going to eat away at whatever's there. Um, we're expecting another 30 centimetres or so sea level rise in the next 40 odd years, and that's more than New Zealand's seen in the last 100 years. So the rate of rise is definitely going up. How much more we get over the next 100 years, well, I'll leave Tim to, to talk about that. It really depends on how much more warming we allow to happen. So we, we need to stop this from happening, right? The, the climate's already warmed up a degree and we've seen increases in extremes. You've seen the news lately about the amazing extremes happening in Europe and North America in their summer of this year. Um, we've got to turn this graph around and it's, it's going to be hard, but it can be done. We do have technologies to stop the rise at least. So if we want to get onto that blue line, we want to see no more than one more degree of warming. There's only a certain amount of carbon dioxide that you can put in the air before you guarantee two degrees of warming. And at present rates of emissions, we've got something like 15 or maybe at most 20 years before there'll be so much carbon dioxide in the air we'll guarantee two degrees of warming at the present rate of emissions. If you would like to see one and a half degrees only, and a lot of small island states in the Pacific would like that because it means much less sea level rise, we've probably got seven or eight years from now, middle of the 2020s, before there'll be enough carbon dioxide in the air to guarantee one and a half degrees of warming. So if we want to meet that target, we'd better start reducing emissions straight away. And I think, yep, yeah, that's the message I'm going to leave you with. So one, one point about this graph, there's a big divergence between the blue line and the red line. 
We know how to get on the blue line, and that means we have a lot of control over the future. If we do get onto that path, we can make the future much, much more manageable than it would be if we, we actually don't do anything at all. So I'll stop there and hand over to our next presenter.